Welcome, friends, to this fifth edition of the Lime Feed Magazine Hall Magazine Review Video Series thingy. Or Mag Hall, just call it Mag Hall, that's heaps, heaps easier. Uh, there's no slow news this edition. It might come back, but we're skipping it for now and just heading straight for the reviews. There's still housekeeping at the end, plus a link to a making of video which I made earlier in the week. Uh, but for now, we're just going to head straight for the reviews, starting with Modern Design Review. Okay, Modern Design Review is a new publication put together by editor Laura Housley and designed and art directed by uh, a design agency called Graphic Thought Facility, who, if you haven't heard of them before, and you might not have if you're not sort of in the graphic design realm, they're a really well-respected and established agency in London who are responsible for sort of overhauling Habitat in the 2000s, and uh, they've produced just beautiful, beautiful work for all sorts of clients, um, art-based and design-based. Uh, so it makes perfect sense that they're being called on to help design an actual design magazine. Actually, it seems like something that should have happened a long time ago. Um, oh yeah, because they, they had a long sort of affiliation with Tom Dixon as well, producing many publications for him in, like, for his, um, uh, they used to do newspapers that, that were designed, uh, featuring Tom Dixon sort of furniture and stuff like that. Uh, this is a beautifully produced magazine. I cannot gush about how nice it is just to hold and flick through, and that it's got the. It just feels like every part of it has been really well designed, which you want from a magazine that focuses on objects and design of objects. So it's sort of product design and industrial design, uh, but not how you would normally see it. This is um, a beautiful article about. Uh, Japanese wood making traditional ways of sort of joining wood without using metal or nails or anything like that um, and the magazine's full of like interesting takes on uh, a sort of realm that's become a bit confusing I mean I guess you sort of you can look at uh, stuff like design that covers a lot of product design as well as architecture and you think you're sort of getting to know about what's out there but it doesn't, it's not until you stop and flick through something like this that you realize how broad the definition product design really is. This article is about a designer who just tries to move light around his house or um, is really conscious of sort of where light travels and how to, how to sort of manipulate it and things like that. Uh, everything is just incredibly well photographed. Uh, it's, um, the design is not very shouty it's quite calm which of course you know uh, allows for the photography and the products to sort of shine through um, and it's even though it's like full of sort of quite long not long essays but there's a lot to take in they still got this nice sort of section at the back which is a bit more edible in little chunks um, <laughs> so usually this is sort of at the front to lead you into the magazine but they've put it at the back as sort of uh, a respite after taking in so much amazing sort of photography and, and information. This is the first edition. Uh, like I said, it's beautifully produced as an object, which makes sense because they're talking about um, product design. Uh, you've in, Just holding it in your hand just feels really nice. And first edition, really excited, cannot gush about it enough. I just, I just think you need to go and check it out for yourself. And weirdly enough, as the distribution seems really good, <laughs> I was really worried about not being able to get hold of a copy, but I found one in a news agency in Melbourne, which is just miraculous these days. Um, the second magazine I'm going to talk about is called Protein. I was going to review that previous issue there, uh, but I thought I'd better, pre I better talk about the latest one that you can actually go out and buy in shops. Now, Protein is a, I, I want to say trend forecasting company, but I have a feeling that they're not that easy to describe. Uh, and they've evolved like any 
sort of similar company in all different ways. And at the moment, they're publishing magazines. They've helped relaunch Graphic as an online sort of magazine. I don't know if you can call it an online magazine. It's more like a sort of feed of articles. I don't know how you describe it. <laughs> so it's it's interesting because um, they produce this as sort of a promotional piece for the consultation work they do. But then it also, like, for instance, with the ad for graphic, helps promote some of their sort of brands that they've gathered around them. Um, the designer, she's she is from Vice, as far as I know. That was where she was before she came to Protein. Her name is Imogen Bellotti, and she's done a phenomenal job at just reshaping the magazine. The previous dish, few issues were designed by Max Spencer, I think, and they were really, really well done. But she's just sort of taken that and, and um, given it a bit more formalization, I think. Uh, you can see it sort of conforms to, oh, I love these illustrations by, um, oh, I've actually commissioned him before. He's great. I'm just looking up his name. <laughs> um, flick, flick, flick. Victor Hashmang. His work is just amazing. It's very influenced by that 80s. I think it was called Fine Line Drawing. Really interesting stuff. Um, but yeah, you can see it sort of conforms to this sort of trend for black and white and everything centered. But there is still, it still feels sort of modern. The previous issue was slightly better designed, I think, because it, it sort of was less even in its tone. I think the problem with a lot of you know, the trend with modern independent magazines at the moment is that the tone is quite <laughs> sort of monoline <laughs> a lot of the way through. And if you're going to do that, you really need the photography and the illustration to pop, which is what's happening here. This was a great article about just busy women doing jobs that, you know, don't discriminate, you know, gender wise or anything like that, as the world should be. <laughs> it's pretty much <laughs> an article about how things uh, should be and be encouraged it's quite odd um oh and this is fantastic this is about um toys f to help kids learn about how to make computers or how computers work so there's like a thing where you can plug vegetables in to make things move um the typeface throughout is post grotesque a new typeface from village and i think it's it's just it's a really solid publication I have. I don't know if there will be a graphic publication, but if this is the quality that Protein are putting together for their own, then I'm hoping that um, if anything happens to graphic, it will follow suit. Um, we are looking at Mark, who are celebrating their 50th issue. It's definitely not their 50th year, so it must be their issue. I was really excited to buy this because they had a cover competition and the results are inside. As far as the magazine itself, I've been buying it since it started when it was a larger format and designed by a group called Machine. Um, that Those initial few issues were, I don't know, they, didn't, they, they mustn't have got a very good reception because they dramatically overhauled the whole magazine to become uh, bi, bi-monthly and pretty much is the format you see here now. Although it's gone through a number of redesigns, um, which makes it exciting. The, the current redesign, I'm a bit, I feel it's a little, a little dull actually, and maybe a little sort of all over the place. Um, yeah, which makes me worry that, um, and I think it is a worry for architecture magazines in general that uh, architects want a really serious read and if you make it look too frivolous. But then you've got to, sort of got to keep people's attention as well. It's quite tricky. Yeah, so this is their 50th anniversary section and they're the runners-up, those two covers there by various designers. But you can see, like, uh, there was sort of the slightly lame little house made of marzipan and then... There was some really amazing sort of stuff that people had done. That one I'm pointing to... I couldn't get faster with my flicking. That's my favourite anyway. It's by... Um, Jakrit Anakal. Oh my god. It says Design Reform Council in brackets. 
I saw that online somewhere and I just really liked it. What they also did, I love anniversary issues. They got art people to design cakes for them. <laughs> oh my God, a few, you know, magazine cakes. If there was a magazine, oh, there are magazines about cakes, aren't there? I bet there aren't any good ones. Can someone please do a really good magazine just about cake? Because that would be my dream. Oh, if you can hear noise in the background too, that's rain. I'm doing this on a really rainy um, afternoon in Melbourne, which is the best time to be inside looking at magazines, really. Um, I should say the designers, I think they're pretty much the same designers I've had for a while. They used to have a thing that this publishing house, they do frame magazine as well, and they would switch designers every couple of years or something. But I have a feeling that this design team... I think it's been there for a while um, and Bob, led by Barbara Iwanika. Um, I have to check actually, I think she does frame as well, I'm not sure. Uh, it's still like a really fresh, amazing sort of magazine, but I just, I'm not so keen on the design direction both frame and Mark have been taking lately. Frame particularly has redone their whole editorial stance and it's odd. It's a really odd sort of thing. Um, I didn't actually buy an issue because I didn't like it enough. I looked at a digital version uh, and that was enough. But at the same time, like, that sounds harsh, but Frame and Mark are particularly expensive uh, to buy. So when I buy an issue, I really want to make sure it's one I really, really like. If My dream would be to, you know, subscribe and have every issue, but it's just not. It's way too expensive, especially if you're in Australia. So, yeah, you can see it's these openers I loved. But then look at the facing page. It's just like, oh, it's a bit dull. <laughs> It's a fine line, the architecture magazines, though. You've really... I've, I've designed one before, and you really can't be too crazy and you can't be too conservative. It's a very odd sort of balance to try and get. Um, living is pretty much a replacement for Cas de Arbiter, which is a magazine I loved that was... A, that was had been around for a while and then had a redesign by Wink Creative, which was really good. And now they've gone to this sort of flimsy, weird format that I think is meant to make it more accessible. But at the same time, they've lost a lot of the, the quality that made it such an amazing magazine to buy. And I think, too, they've really sort of focused the magazine on the Italian market. It's an Italian magazine, which... I, I'm pretty sure Case Arbiter had quite a large international following, so I'm not sure how making the magazine seem more like a small local title really helps, especially when you see in here that the actual um, articles and stuff cover all sorts of places. Um, there's always a lot sort of from Holland and, and sort of um, that area of the world so you'd think that making it sort of feel more local was an odd thing to do. I say that because um, it's now called uh, Living Corre de, de la Serra Interiors Magazine. Corre de la Serra, I'm saying that totally wrong, uh, in case you don't know, I'm pretty sure that's a newspaper in Italy. So this is like the newspaper's interiors magazine, and it's like, well... Why would you have a really strong individual brand and then subjugate it to a newspaper, which is, you know, specific to a certain region? It just seemed like a really odd thing to do. Unless Case to Abtel was in real trouble and needed help, but... Uh, see, now I think about that, it was getting thinner and thinner. It's, it's like having worked for publishers, it's really hard to tell... <laughs> Like when something like that happens, whether it's bad decisions on the publishing side of things, you know, working with advertising managers who just don't get their magazines. And believe me, there's enough of them out there that don't read their own the magazines that they're trying to sell. Um, 
I feel like so, that's you know something like that happens, and then the pub, like an inexperienced publisher or a publisher that doesn't really care about the magazine, just decides, oh well, I'm going to use that as an excuse to do something to change things. In this case, sort of make it sort of part of the newspaper rather than an individual brand. Um, yeah, it's the politics of publishing in this modern world <laughs> where nothing, everything's in flux, and no one knows what they're doing. <laughs> Um, I, like, uh, as much as I complained, it's still a good magazine. It's just, I remember when it was a different magazine and it was better. That's, that's the problem. Content wise, content's still strong. I mean, you can see here, they've, it feels like the same team. They've got the same room sets that they used to have, which are just beautiful. The back there, we saw the, the still life, so the flowers, that's something that's carried over. Pretty much all the sort of really high quality content that they were producing seems to have carried over, but it's just been redesigned to look like a really boring mess. And on this really flimsy paper too, it's really horrible flimsy paper. The sort of paper you would expect a newspaper supplement to be printed on, which is probably actually something that, you know, saved them a heap of money, I guess. But um, I miss Case to Arbiter. I don't know why it had to become living. Plus side is that it, I thought it would disappear from newsstands, but it is around if you, if you have to hunt it out, but it is around. ID Magazine I've featured a bit. I thought I'd check in. This is the third issue since Terry Jones left. Uh, Terry Jones was the founder, and he was creative director right up to... Um, you know, three issues ago. So decades at the head of this magazine and he sort of stepped away and um, Holly Shackleton has taken over under the uh, finances of Vice, I guess. They're sort of financing the magazine now. And it has become really different. Like, it, it is noticeably different. And I think it's good looking at it three issues in because you that's sort of when the changeover has properly happened oh yeah there's this thing i need i'm going to do i think i'm gonna do a vlog about it but apparently modernism is coming back but i don't think it's modernism like anyone else remembers it <laughs> i think it's modernism as a sort of really pared back aesthetic that's sort of a bit norm core or or something uh, yeah, look out on the Twitter feed because I might be doing a shout out to ask people what they think modernism means now because I think that would be a really good video to do. This issue is worth getting alone because it has Tavi, Tavi Jefferson in it. I hope I said her name right. Uh, Tavi who, for a mag geek like me, I just think, oh, she's the future of publishing. Like, what a heavy title to put on someone, I think. Uh, it's no wonder she's sort of trying, veering off into sort of doing acting and and all sorts of stuff. She talks a lot about when she first started blogging and how she's developed Rookie, which is her um, sort of publishing outlet, if you like. It sounds like she's sort of investigating lots of other things at the moment, though, and Rookie is sort of part of what she does, as well as sort of acting and all sorts of stuff. Um, oh, I've, I've rabbited on about Tavi. I just think she's amazing. If you, her TED talk, go see her TED talk. Maybe I'll put a link below or something. This was just a really lovely layout, I thought. This is my favorite layout in the, in the issue. I thought it was really nice. Just wanted to show you that. And that previous fashion shoot was just so quintessentially English. Like, I was like, why has no one done this before? <laughs> it was like she, they'd gone to Camden and bought everything there. The layout, what is it going to say? Oh yeah, there's, the, actually I'm more intrigued by the, the, the actual design of, of ID is a lot calmer. It's a lot more, uh, there's, a, there's a set style for things, you know. It, it doesn't change as much as it used to. It's not as random or, if you read anything by Terry Jones, he sort of says how he likes to do things really quickly and that, um, it you know he talks about instant design doing things really quickly. It looks like this isn't as instant. There is a te there is a sort of style and a set template. Um, I think it's Graham Rainthwaite. Rainthwaite. 
can't pronounce anything, can I? Who is art director, and he has he's got a Graham Round Round Roundthwaite. Um, he's worked on a lot of magazines for a long time, like The Face, um, and this is sort of and Trace magazine, and this is sort of a really calm des design template for him. But it feels it feels confident. It feels like the new team has really come together. I feel like it's a good team working on ID now, and that even though it is different, it is still quality. Like it. It's in safe hands, essentially. It won't ever be the same without Terry Jones, but it's in safe hands. And that is a really top issue. Oh, and, and the articles have cha are really interesting too. They're editorially uh, worth checking out as well. Um, okay, I had to include this mostly for the typography. Like, I think everyone's seen it. I, I personally not fussed about you know, the cover star, and it's not really worth... It's almost like, just leave the guy alone. <laughs> He's, you know, he might have famous parents, but that's no reason to put him on the cover of a magazine. He's just let him grow up normally, maybe. Um, yeah, see here, this is exciting for me because we've gone through a period of really... not sort of dull typography in a way, but at the same time, really nice nice layouts and stuff like we've we've this magazine still adheres to it but it's this thing of black and white text there's no color uh in a lot of trendy uh, current magazines the colors sort of being drained out and often the photography is really sort of not colorless but of a certain hue or a certain palette as well and what's crept into uh, Man About Town is this wacky typography that sort of referenced display typefaces from the 70s. Something I'm personally invested in because I've made it a mission to sort of collect as many of these, you know, that are digital as possible. This looks like they've sort of uh, photocopied or something the, the titles, which is nice again because it's... Um, Going back to that idea of the zine or the fanzine, um, you can see all these wacky, wacky typefaces. It's uh, the actual <laughs> opening feature just didn't really do anything for me. I was more interested in poring over the typography. Complete type geek with this magazine. I was like, oh, it's that, you know, that's Windsor. Oh, they're using that. Oh, that's interesting. Um... I think it complements the content. This was a really interesting... It looked... It was part of the fashion section, but it's just sort of random photography, no, you know, clothing credits or anything. Sort of adding to this idea that it's sort of a scrapbook, I guess. Oh, scrapbooking. Is that a trend, then, to make things look like they've been scrapbooked? <laughs> Oh, is someone going to do a magazine that looks like a scrapbooking project? Because that could be interesting and gross at the same time. I feel like that's something Bloomberg Business Week would probably <laughs> maybe attempt. Um, yeah, so I think they've been deliberately scrappy. Um, but I think it's worked. And if you compare this to like, um, I guess like pop or another man or something where they've tried to do something similar but it's not as in, it's not as engaging I guess it's a bit a bit too scatty uh, this is interesting because this is a long time collaborator with ID magazine and if you look back at copies of ID from the 90s and 2000s you'll see how influential the photographer has been on the layout uh, or vice versa I'm just showing you this because Terry Richardson's been in the news lately for being a dangerous lech, and that's just to prove there's an equal opportunities lech. He will lech no matter what sex or who's around. It's just a lech, maybe. <laughs> I don't know, I don't know him, I can't assume that. Um, that's all I'm going to say about Terry Richardson. You can read all the news articles you want about that if you're really interested. Uh, yeah, this is again like, oh, this thing of quiche, is that because of, um, Jemay? 
Is that why he's wearing a thing with quiche on it? Is that really a reference to an Australian comedy show? Somebody tell me, leave a comment or something. I just, I keep looking at it thinking, is that because of Jamey? That's so weird. Did I just say it really poncy? Jamey? Um, I featured Pin Up last time and I was, I don't really like to double up on mags, but I was, I wasn't so happy with the last one. And then this one came out and it's really good. <laughs> So anything I said before, just ignore it because it's 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 my favorite again. Um, not so much for the front section. I'm just flicking through that to show you some things, but it's not the exciting bit. There's some good interviews. Like interesting that the magazine started off very much about architecture, but in the last few issues have veered more towards interior design and particularly product design. So they're, they're talking to furniture makers and textile designers. Um, Natalie de Blazer, who is part of the Memphis Milano group, she's been doing sculpture and there's some of that in here. Patricia Arcola does um, furniture. Um, so I think it's, I think they've broadened their remit. <laughs> you know, this is interior design. This is the inside of Dover Street Market in New York as it's being built. Uh, nice to see too, they've stuck to this idea of like interesting print techniques. So it's CMYK plus fluoro colors in the background, making the photography really sort of pop. And I love saying things pop. It's just a cool term. This is the bit I was really excited about. It's a Milano special because of the, I'm pretty sure because of the Milan Furniture Fair, which is again, a sort of more interior design and product design led uh, event. And it's just, it's really interesting. The text is all stretched up and down and around and they've chosen noise it, I think. So um, it's a lot rounder and more modern looking. I think they were getting stuck in this sort of, just, you know, I, I like that they use Arial for everything, but I think they're getting stuck with the rather typeface choices, but this has just really come along. And it's got a lot of things that remind me of ID in the early days, where there's lots of sort of print techniques that you're like, what, how, how? Because <laughs> it looks like it's all colored stock, but then there's color printed on the stock. Like if you look at the actual magazine on and look at the edge of it, it's all pink and green, which makes you think that the paper's either pink or green. But then they've printed the green, I don't know what's happened. I don't, I don't know, but I love when you see something in a magazine. And this is something print can do and web can't. That Oh, this is, um they've teamed up with Print All Over Me. Print All Over Me are really interesting. You should look at them, P-A-O-M. Uh, and that's an ad for a party they're having. Yeah, but I really love it, like I was saying, in a magazine where you see a print effect and you it boggles your brain a bit, you know? it's And that's it's something that only a really skilled graphic designer could pull off, I think. Stephen Mayle was really good at it with ID Magazine. Uh, this is our last one, and it's a bit of a scrappy one, but I wanted to include it because I visited Sydney recently, and this is produced in Sydney, uh, Australia has a lot of free titles that are often better than, you know, the ones produced by massive publishing houses. This one is pretty much just, you know, talking about arts events around Australia, but it's the anniversary issue, so they sort of showed you lots of old covers and 20 years have been around. They're called Real Time. I, I personally really like the design. It's not super fancy. It's mainly based on the one typeface. Um, but it's really, you know, a nice read. And this is just really nice to see, like, a sort of, I th again, I love anniversary issues where magazines get to sum up everything they do and where they've been and what's been going on. And they cover sort of all the sort of extracurricular activities that, that they do as a, as a publication. And it makes you realize that even though something might be free and might be street press, they're still like, um, you know, there's still a lot that goes on around them. They're still really busy, uh, engaging sort of titles that you can pick up just for free that you might walk past normally. And you're like, wow, this has actually been going for 20 years and this is all the stuff they do. 
Well, and that's the end of another review. Next up, housekeeping. Housekeeping for this edition, uh, I started weekly vlogging over on YouTube where you'll find this video and a whole heap of other stuff. Pretty much I'm migrating a lot of thing, a lot of the stuff I do from Vimeo to YouTube. There'll still be like an archive of videos on Vimeo and I'll keep uploading the mag whole videos there as well. But if you want to get the latest stuff, it's going to be on YouTube from now on. Uh, if you wanted to check out my vlog channel, it's Bod Vlogski. So B O J V L O G S K I. <laughs> I hope I, I hope I said that right. Yeah, if you search that on YouTube, I'll put a link somewhere around here so you can see it. But the latest one is a how I made this video and how you can make your own Magcore videos. So I'm hoping you'll be inspired to do that. Uh, and if you want to find out how I do it, uh, check out the video. Second bit of housekeeping, uh, last time I announced that I was looking for work, hopefully in Europe somewhere. Uh, I'd really like to work in like uh, Amsterdam or somewhere in Germany. Uh, so if you have hear of anything or if you have any leads or if there's anything I can help with, uh, get in touch. Uh, and you can visit okinterrupt.net for folio samples and more. The last bit of housekeeping probably should be that I still haven't got around to updating the line feed website, <laughs> but there's an idea there that I want to do, but I just have to work out when because I'm focusing a lot on video at the moment and it's eating up a lot of time. That and also Minecraft Pocket Edition, which is an addiction I really need to get a handle on somehow. <laughs> Um, as always, please visit Stack Magazines, Mag Culture, and Mag Pile if you're a maglophile like I am and get your head fed properly. Steve at Stack Magazines is also doing weekly magazine reviews, shorter than this one but uh, more regular, so check them out as well. And that's it from me. Keep yourselves nice, and I'll see you in another couple of months with another mag haul video. Uh, and check out my vlogging at Bodger Vlogski. Weekly vlogs. Bye bye.